Okay, migrating Flex to Flex.js. Okay. All right, um, who am I? Um, I've been, I kind of fell into programming by mistake. Um, I was had a, had a print, print shop and uh, had some problems with InDesign, didn't do what I wanted it to do. So I figured out how to make it do what I wanted it to do. And so that led me into developing different, different solutions around InDesign, started marketing them. Um, uh, I fell into Flex when I, went, when I needed to extend, extend the design for Pet with Panels. That was about nine years ago. Um, uh, Adobe has since uh, dis disabled uh, fl Flash Panels, which was uh, what I was doing there. So, so Flex.js kind of became uh, pretty central about things that I've been doing lately, along with, uh, along with my uh, print UI application, which is also um, had to be migrated from Flex to Flex.js. So I've had lo lots of reasons to migrate from Flex to Flex.js, and that's basically what I've been doing for the last year. Okay, what kind of name is Harbs? Um, <laughs> when I was, uh, Harbs is a nickname I've held, held since I was a um, teenager. Uh, my given name is Gavriel Harbader. Um, if, you, if, we, if you attend uh, my fam fam family gatherings, uh, you try to call Harbs, lots of people turn around. Um, so, but that's kind of what I go by. Um, how easy is migration? Well, I guess, you know, it depends on what you're trying to migrate. Um, if basically the better separation you have between view and model and things like that, the easier it's going to be. Uh, the more it's all mixed together, the more you, you know, you're very, you know, the more it's, you know, everything, you know, the, the more the Flash APIs are kind of integral to what you're doing, the harder it's going to be. Okay, so um, why did I pick Flex.js rather than just you knowing, using a normal uh, JavaScript uh, framework? Uh, the answer is I tried, actually. Um, I spent a year um, creating a um, JavaScript quote-unquote version of our web application for, uh, for mo modifying and design documents uh, using Angular. Um, very basic in terms of functionality, very slow in terms of performance, um, real, really big pain to maintain. Um, so we spent a good solid year on it uh, and had very little to show for it. Um, that kind of cemented into my mind that I definitely don't want Angular and it kind of um, uh, disinterested me in pursuing most, most of the standard JavaScript uh, uh, frameworks. So, um, so Flux.js kind of became the, uh, natural, uh, the natural next step. Okay, so how do I know um, migrating to Flux, Flux to Flux.js is actually possible and it works and something that you want to do? Okay, so, so far to date I've done three, basically three uh, major migrations of uh, flex, from Flex Flex applications to Flex JS. Um, we have a large scale web application, which is uh, basically um, basically InDesign Online, which is basically a design application uh, for manipulating text and images and objects and uh, pr producing output of you know, JPEGs, PDFs, things like that. Um, we've migrated the vast majority of the application to Flex.js already. There still has some uh, less than five major features that still need to be migrated, still need to be completed before we're going to call the first version feature complete. Um, but it's been working very well. Um, been doing this together with Yishai, and uh, I think we both, we both think that it's, it's gone, gone pretty well. Um, we, I have a number of flash, flash panels in a design that needed to be migrated. Uh, I've done the first one. Um, that, um, and I've uh, migrated the TLF framework, which is partially functional right now. Uh, does compile, does work on a basic level. Uh, needs a text engine. I've created one, uh, I created a half of one, which I donated to Flex, another, another one, another three, three quarters of one, which I'm probably not donating, at least for now, to Flex. 
Um, so it's sort of working now, not completely. Hopefully by the time we're done, it'll be, um, it'll be uh, in better shape. So how long does it actually take to migrate? Uh, so the web app, we've been working on it for about a year, still working on it. Um, go into a little bit more about how the, you know, the different stages of the, of, of the uh, migration and which part, how long each part, each part took, and uh, we'll go into that a little bit more later. Uh, the InDesign panel took about two months. Um, most of that was pro do related to problems specific to InDesign. Um, they, the flash panels allowed synchronous communication between the uh, InDesign scripting model, um, basically use, using uh, external object. And so there's, there's a very, very, uh, flash allows for very uh, um, transparent communication with outside scripting. Um, and the uh, Chromium embedded framework that InDesign uses uh, does not, basically, if there's a uh, um, there's a V8, V8 version of uh, JavaScript that's running it's in its own own world, and there's like a, an, an event model basically which communicates between between the do, two different uh, uh, two different worlds. So it's all asynchronous. So most of the work that I was that was involved in in migrating the InDesign panel was due to this migrating syn synchronous code to asynchronous code, which was a big big mess. Uh, the uh, migration of TLF took about a month. Most of that time was due to compiler issues, um, which are mostly fixed at this point. Okay, um, what were our challenges? Um, what, was, what were the, the uh, things that we needed to get done before the migration was possible? So first of all, the application does a tremendous amount of reading and writing XML. Uh, so for me, XML and E4X was a very big one. Uh, I didn't even bother trying to do the, conver to the conversion before FlexJS supported XML and E4X. That was what I was working on about a year ago. I was working on the Flex side. Alex was doing most of the compiler work on that. Uh, so that's, that's working pretty well at this point. Um, there's a lot of transformations. Um, we need a cross-browser rendering in terms of that. We had to figure out uh, whether we wanted to do Canvas or SVG, we settled on SVG. I hope it was the right decision. Uh, we needed TLF, um, which I've been working on recently. <coughs> needed to write a new text engine from scratch. That's been fun. Uh, and FlexJS is still still not completely mature. Uh, Justin just touched on some of the some of the issues that he he uh, he came across. Uh, so we we had a lot of work in the actual FlexJS framework. Um, fixing things, adding components, um, and improving things. So, uh, what works and what doesn't? What um, what's what, what what should you try to migrate as is? What should you try to rebuild? So, basically, business logic from what we've seen, basically, you could just bring it in 100%. Take your logic, copy it over, and 99% of the time, it just works. That's been great. Uh, abstract UI logic, so like, you know, you know, different pieces that are connected to each other, um, you know, things that are not specific to uh, the way components are implemented. Uh, that stuff generally uh, migrates pretty well also. Um, some of the interaction, you know, the, so there are differences in the, in the, uh, in the components and the way the components are composed and the way the components are built, uh, the way the components are you know connected to each other? Uh, so certain things work. You know, there's there's lots lots of lots of um, you know there's there's lots of similarities between into the frameworks and in places where it's similar, you can copy that logic over. Uh, what doesn't work? Don't try to just take your your existing UI components and just bring them over because it's going to create more work than if then building it from scratch. Uh, the differences in um, the the, the paradigms of, the, of, of classic Flex and FlexJS is just too different. Um, you have to get used to the new concepts of, you know, with, uh, with strands and beads and, um, and, you know, things that did certain things in the old Flex don't necessarily do the same things in the new Flex. So you basically, you really, really want to rethink your UI, how it's structured, which components you need, and just build them out from scratch, okay? 
Um, and if you're migrating, you probably have a lot of cruft in your old code, so it's a good time to clean it out anyway. So not the end of the world. OK. Um, what do you, how do you actually do it? OK, so I try to, tried to break it down into steps. As far as I can, as far, as far as I, I can tell, tell there's, like, there's basically eight steps. Number one, using an IDE. Try to do this without an IDE. You're going to be you're going to, you're, don't bother. Um, first thing you want to do is uh, the most errors you're going to get is going to be in your view. So for, if you can, um, you want to try to dis dis disconnect your view. Um, concentrate on first making, making the, Kyle comp comp the code compile. Don't worry whether it actually works. Just try to make it, make it compile. Uh, create dummy classes. We'll get more into that later. Uh, then reattach the view. Create dummy classes for the view. Rebuild your components. And then fill in your dummies. <clears throat> ID. So I started with the Flash, flash Builder. It works um, when it doesn't crash. Um, I've used FDT uh, as well. Uh, most of most of the conversion, when, most of what I did with uh, TLF when I was converting TLF was in FDT. I fixed all the compiler components there. Uh, if you like IntelliJ, wonderful. I haven't managed to really get it to work for me yet, probably because I didn't invest enough time in it. Uh, apparently, Flash Develop works for Windows. Again, I haven't tried that. Moonshine is something else I haven't tried, and. I'm a big VS Code fan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so VS Code is what I'm basically pretty much using now. Um, for migration, um, I mean, I haven't tried since the newest features in, v in VS Code. Um, but you're going to have a lot of um, import cleanups to do. You're going to have a lot of uh, find and replaces, uh, reporting bug errors and whatever. You probably can use VS Code at this point. Um, when I was doing the migration, VS Code wasn't uh, wasn't mature enough at that point. But I would, if the next migration I was doing, I'd probably just try to do it in VS Code and see how that goes. Okay. Um, so as far as disconnecting the view, um, the original application was was built using pure via uh, MVC. Um, so that was really actually worked out very well because. Um, in bootstrapping the application, so pure MVC, you have commands that basically adds all the views. So all we needed to do to disconnect the entire view from the application was to just comment out the um, command which which uh, creates the view, and that that took took away the entire dependency list on anything in our view. So we were able to compile the application with just the business logic, and the view was just commenting, commenting out a few lines of code. So that was that was that was really 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 good. Um, obviously, if there's you know if the view is more uh, intricately connected, so then it's going to be a little more difficult. But as much as you can disconnect the view at first, it's going to be easier because you're going to have to be real building that 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 view anyway. Okay, concentrating on making the code compile. Okay. You're going to get lots of errors. When we first, when we first just poured it over and disconnected the view, we had what about like three thousand errors, something like that. Um, but uh, fixing these comp compilation errors, um, you know, as as overwhelming as it might seem, um, it allows you to focus on you know, you know okay, get, you know, you just go go through the errors, take this error away, take that away, take that away. Uh, you'll find that a lot of the errors are just repeating ones. As soon as you uh, create a dummy class, which is basically an, uh, a, um, an empty class, which just gives the compiler a reference. Um, so as soon as you add these classes and you add these methods, it makes lots of, lots of errors go away at the same time. Very often it causes new, new errors because there's, you know, um, there's uh, dependencies on each other and but uh, generally, the number of errors goes down. It's not quite as, and it's also not quite as bad as it might first see, uh, seem at first. Um, it's really mindless work, you know. Just you know, find this error, okay, this error, create a thing. Uh, but it's str strangely satisfying. It's kind of, kind of like, kind of like, kind of like Angry Birds, you know. <laughs> S you know, squash those things. Um, okay, creating dummy classes. Uh, so basically, it's a two-step two, two process. Uh, for each time you, you, you encounter a class, generally it's going to be either either Flash or Flex. 
for the most part. Um, you take, find the, you take the import statement, create a new class, and search and replace all your imports to import this new one. Um, some of these are gonna some, so some import statements are gonna 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 kind of respond to dummy classes. Others, FlexJS has uh, has has uh, equivalents. You know, so you know, so mouse events, events, so, uh, um, matrix, point, rectangle, all these things. Basically, you're gonna you're gonna, you're gonna transfer the flash ones to the FlexJS ones. Uh, things that don't that FlexJS does not have equ equivalents to, then you're gonna have to gonna have to create your dummy classes for those. Um, so initially, the dummy classes should be empty with no methods, no properties. And then basically, each time you find a property or a method that you used in that class, just add a stub for that, and it'll make the compiler error go away, okay? Why do it like this? There's basically three advantages. It's, it's, re it's really, really quick to be able to get the compiler, the code to compile. Um, I was able to get the application to, from the point of the initial, um, I mean, this is a, this is a an application with literally hundreds of classes. Um, I was a, and lots of very deep integration into you know fl uh, flash drawing uh, commands, TLF. It was it was nuts. Uh, so I was able to get it from the point of the initial migration to be able to compile, not functional, but compile in about two weeks. Uh, that's the, that was that was. I was surprised by how fast we were able to do it. Um, so it's, it let's it let's let's you quick and get it to the point where it compiles, so you can, then you can start actually making it functional. Uh, it gives you a list of what you actually used, right? So trying to trying to get a, get an audit of um, what your problems are in your application is a very difficult thing to do. So if you create, by creating these dummy classes, you, first of all you have a list of classes which you used and what kind of functionality you go, you go, you're going to have to fill in. Uh, and then it also gives you a list of, ac of actual functionality within those classes that you actually used. So it's not, you don't necessarily have to um, re-implement an entire flash uh, uh, class with, you know, 75 uh, APIs when you only use two or, two or three of them. S next step is reattaching the view. It's going to create a whole new class of errors. Um, uh, you're probably going to want to create uh, dummy classes for everything that's in an MXML file uh, because you're going to want to rebuild those. Uh, again, that will give you um, a very clear, uh, clear idea of what your external APIs are on that. Um, create dummy class for you, and then you're going to run a rebuild the components. Okay, so. So you're going to want to create new files for that, new XML files, um, new new AS files if you want. Um, so what we did, which worked well, was we kept the old files. We just dumped them all into an external folder just to have them as a reference. Uh, we used it as a as a uh, as a loose template, but basically, but looked over you know, trying to figure out exactly what we need from them. Um, and then most of the functions in the script locked block uh, we were able to just copy over. Um, you know, with caveats, um, and that worked pretty well. It, it also works well to have the old app source. Right. In a, in a parallel project, so you can actually see it functioning. Right. So if you keep your old app in a, in, a, in, a, in your environment where you can actually run it and debug it and see what it was supposed to do, and and then make sure that the new implementation does the same thing, that's also helpful. Um, so the last step basically is uh, you need to uh, replace the missing classes. Um, very often you can find flux, uh, flux JS classes which do the, do the same thing, uh, sometimes in a slightly different way. Uh, sometimes you're gonna have to find your own way of doing it, doing things, uh, and you're gonna have to do get, get your hands dirty and actually implement things. What was the hardest part? Um, number one, flux JS was missing lots of things. Um, we uh, we had a very heavy uh, um, dependency on f on SVG. SVG was kind of shaky. Um, still not what I'd call sturdy, but it's less shaky than it was. Um, so we had to implement a lot of that. Uh, I had to implement a lot of you know things that should have worked, didn't work, could have worked. Um, 
so that was that was a big 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 part of the effort. Um, because FlexJS is, is is young, uh, the component set is not quite uh, not not complete. So we had to fill things in as we went along. Um, the other part, which uh, was nice about Flash, was there's no very few browser-dependent issues. Um, there are just no end to them. Uh, things that are supposed, things that are supposed to work and just don't. Um, as you mean, you know, the one, the one, one of the things that just boggle my mind is just transformed SVG don't get mouse events on most browsers. Which browsers do we have the most problems? Probably Internet Explorer. <laughs> so it doesn't work. It's like, uh, are you supporting like E eleven or? Um, I think it should be supporting I ten. I think so for the most part. I'm not sure. I don't know. We haven't we haven't we haven't tested I well enough. After we test I, we're going to decide exactly which version we support. <laughs> Okay, so that that might that might help to determine because we are using MDL, right? MDL is an, uh, uh, that was actually very timely for us when MDL MDL was developed right when we needed it. Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so there's lots of. I mean, there's still issues. Um, just yeah, just just one 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 small one. Uh, What is all right. all right. So this is this is actual this is an actual application that we're working on. So this is all SVG stuff, uh, images. Uh, this is text rendered by my um, my um, new. Uh, New text renderer. Um, these are MDL components over here on the side. Um, so this this is in Chrome. Works great. The application is centered the way it should be using the component that we were using. In Safari, just you know, you just just kind of bring it over there. It you know, but it's 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 instead of it being centered, the left side is centered. So you have all these kinds of issues. Uh, this is something we're going to have to figure out why the layout uh, is doing this, but it's just you know that's just the way it is. Um, you know I don't see this as a FlexJS problem. I think this is just a general um, browser development problem. You know just, there's just so many so many um, inconsistencies across browsers. If anything, FlexJS makes it easy because a lot of these things are kind of um, done on the framework level. Um, okay, so back back to okay, gotchas. All right, what uh, what are things to look out for when you're doing a migration from Flex to FlexJS? Okay, probably number one is circulars. Um, Google compiler is very finicky about uh, circular dependencies. Uh, in Flash, you were able to do almost anything in terms of circulars. It was really uh, very intelligent about the way it compiled things. Uh, you could have, you know, class A relying on class B, relying on back in class A, and you can you can make you can make spaghetti code without a problem, uh, as long as you didn't have um, true, true true circular of cl class A, which is which inherits class B, which inherits class A. You were fine. Um, Google doesn't allow any classes to rely on any classes and back again. Okay, so sometimes you can live with that. Very often you can't. Just off the top of my head, two cases, right? So uh, in FlexJS we support XML and E4X. So in E4X, XML knows about XML list, and XML list knows about XML. So that's a base, a circular. That there's really no way uh, to resolve. Um, TLF, um, all over the place you have circulars. I mean, just, you know, paragraph elements know about span elements, which know about paragraph elements, and which know about um, text flows, which know about paragraphs, which 
they just all know about each other. So it's one big happy family. So it, Google compiler doesn't like that. Um, so there's a compiler option called a remove circular. A circular, I think there's a missing S there. Um, which basically causes the, uh, the flex compiler to remove uh, these circulars. So basically what it does is uh, puts in a certain, only, only in one place, it tells, it tells, uh, tells the Google compiler to, um, that this, the class A is dependent on class B, and it lies about the fact that class B is dependent on class A. It just, just tells, doesn't tell the Google compiler about that. So as long as the classes are loaded in the correct order, that works fine. Um, so I ran into lots of problems around this. I think they're basically all fixed at this point. Um, took going back and forth with Alex about a month, uh, a month or two ago, uh, when I was working on TLF to get this all straightened out. Um, there are certain things, certain limitations with the way it's done, but for the most part, it works. Uh, related to that, um, static constants and initialized var variables. Um, don't. Uh, well, I mean, actually, you can, but as long as 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 long as you 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 limit yourself to native Java, JavaScript classes, then it's okay. So you can do uh, const um, name string equals whatever it is. That's fine. Uh, if you try to do const, uh, you know, my thingy of type thingy, uh, then your application is going to blow up because um, the uh, in JavaScript, any any constants or variables that are initialized when they're declared uh, is run as soon as the JavaScript file is loaded. Uh, because of the way the circulars are resolved in uh, the compiler, you have no guarantee which which class which which file is loaded before the, which one. So you can be trying to be trying to instantiate a class before that class is actually declared. Um, so, very simply, don't do it. Um, so, instead of using constants, use getters, okay? So, um, if you're worried about, uh, if you're worried about performance, so you can, you know, you can uh, cache, cache the getter the first time you, you, you run it. Um, and for static variables, um, use lazy inst instantiation. So, basically, the first time you need it, you should instantiate it. Um, that's pretty much what you need to know in terms of statics. Um, if you stick to those two rules, you should be all right. Um, be aware of as. So you could use as for the most part the way you did in classic um, uh, action script. Basically, you know, um, you know, my 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 thing as whatever. Um, and if you don't do anything, it will, it will call uh, language.as, which basically checks um, whether, which calls language.is, which checks what, it, what the class, class, class is. Um, and if it's not that object, it will return null. Um, you probably do not want to do this in JavaScript for the most part, because that adds a lot of overhead at runtime. Um, you're calling every single time you ca you're casting something, you're running this check, which has, I don't know, 20 steps or something in certain cases, uh, to check whether or not it is that object, and then returning null based on that. Um, so 99% of the time, you don't want to do that in JavaScript. Um, you general, for m most use, uses of as is just uh, to make the compiler happy. Um, so the way to get clean JavaScript code is to use the compiler option of JS output optimizations equals skip as conversions. coercions. Um, if you don't want to use that, um, you can disable the as calls in specific places by putting a uh, comment at the beginning of your function, uh, flex, flex JS ignore coercion, um, with the name of the class that you want to ignore the coercion for. Um, alter, alterna, alterna, alternately, you can um, use the compiler option of skip as coercions, and in specific cases where you might want to use as to return a null, if it's if it's not that object, you can use FlexJS emit coercions coercion to uh, force the compiler to actually add in the 
uh, the in language that is called. Uh, int isn't <laughs> okay. Um, basically, um, in in Flash, you declare something as an int, and you do mathematics, which you know you do uh, four divided by three, right? Or uh, you know you know ten divided ten divided by three or something. Uh, you, ten divided by three will give you three. Uh, if you in JavaScript, if you do ten divided by three, that'll give you three point three. Um, even declaring an int doesn't solve the problem. Uh, this is probably the, something that should be uh, should be fixed in the compiler if you're uh, if you have a uh, have a mathematical uh, equation which could uh, return a floating point number. Uh, it probably the compiler should probably add in a um, uh, floor to, uh, to to convert it to an int, but it currently doesn't. So basically, if in cases where this is important, you're going to want to um, you're going to want to floor your result. Um, a very common example of this is, is, is a binary search function, uh, where you try you know in, in uh, a a uh, an, an index in an array of right one one and a half is not going to get you a result. So. Uh, Yes, I bumped into this in a few places, actually. Did you write Jira? Huh? Did you write Jira? Oh, I fixed it by flooring it, but uh, okay. but uh, this is something that should be fixed. In the, yeah, I haven't written, I haven't, I haven't put in a Jira yet for that. Uh, internal classes um, generally work. Uh, basically, you know, internal class means that if you declare a class at the bottom of your uh, bottom of your uh, ActionScript file. Uh, it's available to that file. Um, so if it's a simple class, it shouldn't have any problems. Um, if it's a class that inherits some other class, so the compiler doesn't always realize that there's dependencies over there and you could have things blow up. Uh, so be aware of that if necessary. Um, you might want to pull them out to actually separate files. Uh, you should also be aware that it might work and then stop working because the order of the files that, that, are, that are loaded uh, might change. So even though the dependency wasn't declared, it might initially work and not work later. XML, um, in general, it's working pretty well. Uh, we're using it pretty extensively. Um, um, the compiler needs to be aware that your XML is XML or a force X statements <clears throat> will not work. Um, so always declare your XML types. Um, I tried to make XML evaluate to string intelligently, but sometimes you might end up with, with uh, situations where you're trying to find, you know, do a com comparative whether or whether an XML list equals a string, and you're gonna the answer in, in JavaScript might be no. So there are there might be occasions where you need to um, manually do to string. Um, if something doesn't work, let me know. <laughs> um, copying assets, one of the issues we've had um, is we have had dependency on external JavaScript libraries, so we needed the, the JS files. Those don't copy, the compiler co doesn't copy those. Um, I added SVG. Um, it's probably a better way to have copying of files done in the compiler. I think uh, jo uh, Chris uh, touched on that earlier. Um, uh, so that's probably something that could be improved, um, automatic co copying of assets. All right, minification issues. We had lots of those. Um, uh, I don't know if any of you know, know what it's like in Angular dealing with minification, but they have like a really weird, um, you have to, any time you declare, a, you have uh, a controller, you have to do this funny bracket uh, notation to make the uh, minifier realize that it shouldn't minify that. Uh, Flex.js is really smart about how it does it. Uh, it uh, you know it tells the compiler to keep what it's supposed to keep, and you don't have to worry about it. So in general, it's really good. Um, where you've had issues is integration in external libraries. So if you can go around, go ahead and make type defs for your external libraries, then that works pretty well too. Um, it's it's a pain. Uh, we haven't. We gener in general, we didn't want to do that. Um, that could prob probably be improved and make it easier to create those type defs. Um, but um, so, 
um, we've had issues with, with issues with that. Um, generally, when you do have issues, you just need to um, instead of doing dot whatever, you just can you do a bracket bra bracketed code coded bracket call whatever whatever they call that, that thing, um, and then it's, it doesn't get minified and that'll work. Um, in object literals, you always want to use quotes. Okay, so basically, if you have an object. Okay, so, come on. All right, so, uh, object, object. Okay. Okay, so you don't want to do it like this. You want you want to quote the property names like that. Okay, um, because if you don't, they will get minified, passed around to something else, and it's not and you, what it's being passed into is not going to know what it's minified into. Okay, so always quote your object uh, property names. Okay. Um, okay, so I've I had a case where um, I was using a, a typed object in an external library, uh, which had various properties. So I got this object from the external library, and I needed to use it internally. Now I wanted it to be typed, but uh, I'm get I, I was getting it from this external library. So basically, after a lot of head scratching and uh, what I ended up doing was the constructor of my object took the external object and using bracketed notation, I initialized all my lo local variables with the results of that and that ended up working. So again, bra bracket, bracketed uh, notation is the way to go when, you're, when you don't know what you're dealing with. Um, I don't know how much of this can be fixed uh, on the compiler level, um, there might be things, ways to tell the Google compiler uh, to improve this. Um, but with these are the, these are the general issues that you're going to run into. Um, basically, uh, you're probably going to compile your application. It's going to work in the debug. You can try in the release, and something weird happens. And it's generally because something was renamed that you weren't expecting it to. So these are the things to look out for. It's been fun, so that's, that's all I got.